Hello everyone, Dominic here. Thank you for your patience. This episode is a little bit late, because I had to have my wisdom teeth removed on short notice. Thanks for waiting. I hope you enjoy the show. The History of Egypt podcast is part of the Agora Podcast Network. If you enjoy history, check out the History of Germany podcast by Travis Dow, a story of states, peoples, events, and movements that shaped the world we now call Deutschland. Germans have long been active participants and contributors to the sciences which form Egyptology. Learning more about these fascinating people would be well worth your time. That's the History of Germany, available wherever you get your podcast fix. Hello everyone, and welcome back to the History of Egypt podcast, episode 121, Ruler of the Horizons. Today, we witness an event of imperial proportions, as Akhenaten, king of Upper and Lower Egypt, overlord of Nubia, Canaan, and Syria, summons the people of the world to pay homage to his majesty. It's a tale of warfare, coercion, and realpolitik, as communities living in the shadow of Egypt's military might find ways to make the pharaoh happy. This episode was brought to you by Rodney and Catherine, whose generous donations funded the research. Also, thank you to Nicola, Paul, and Jenny, who became patrons of the podcast back in 2018 and have supported me ever since. Folks, you are all too kind and generous. If this were ancient Egypt, I'm sure the pharaoh would be overjoyed with your gifts. Thank you for your support and helping me bring Egypt's stories to the world. For everyone listening, thank you for joining me. This story is for you. The events of this episode take place primarily in regnal year 12 of Akhenaten. But before we get into that, I want to quickly rewind a few years to discuss an important concept which I haven't had the opportunity to discuss. Let me very briefly go back to Regnal Year 9, approximately 1354 BCE. It was about one year before the birth of Prince Tutankhaten, and three years before Queen T came to Amarna. Back then, the king's priorities were still being developed in some important ways. In Regnal Year 9, Akhenaten's religious program, his glorification of Aten, was fully underway. The king was surrounded, literally and figuratively, by symbols of the god. He lived at Aket Aten, horizon of the Aten. His name invoked the deity explicitly, and most of his children were tied to Aten in some symbolic way, Merit Aten, Meket Aten, and so on and so forth. His great queen, Nefertiti, was officially named Nefer Neferu Aten, or How Beautiful is Aten. And his new city was rapidly filling with temples and monuments that glorified the sun god above all. Surely, Akhenaten was now feeling confident that his reforms were stable and effective. But still, there was work to be done. In Regnal Year 9, or thereabouts, Akhenaten decided that the sun god would receive a new name. Previously, Aten had been known by a lengthy, complicated moniker, which went as follows, quote, Ra Hor Aketi, who rejoices in the horizon, in his name of Shu, which is in the Aten, end quote. The old name referenced other deities besides Aten, notably Shu, or Light, and Hor Aketi, Horus of the Two Horizons. This was intentional, for it connected the newer concept of Aten with ancient primeval deities, especially ones associated with creation and the kingship. This made sense, and it probably helped Akhenaten communicate his ideas in ways that other people could understand more easily. But it was also slightly messy, tying Aten's identity up with other, older gods. With this name, Aten wasn't really as pure as Akhenaten may have desired. So, sometime around Regnal Year 9, Akhenaten officially changed the name of the sun god. On monuments and texts, Aten would now be known by a new identity. This new name went as follows, Living Ra, ruler of the horizon, 
rejoicing in the horizon, in his name of Ra, the father who is appearing as Aten. End quote. The old and new names may sound superficially similar, but there are some important differences. Firstly, the old references to Hor Aketi, Horus of the Two Horizons, were removed. Now, Aten was simply Ra, ruler of the horizon. Secondly, the phrase rejoicing in his name had changed from rejoicing in his name of Shu to rejoicing in his name of Ra. So the primeval god of light, Shu, was out, replaced by the more fundamental concept of Ra, the sun, who would encapsulate everything. It's not hard to see the logic of what Akhenaten was doing here. If Ra was the sun, then Ra was the source of all visible light. So the idea of Shu, light, as a separate deity was kind of redundant. It would only add unnecessary complexity to what was a fairly simple idea. Ra was the sun. Ra was light. Ra was the source of creation. Similarly, why have Ra the Horus of the Two Horizons, when you could simply call him Ruler of the Two Horizons? From a certain perspective, it was the same basic concept. Horus was the archetypal ruler god. But references to that falcon just added pointless mental work to the idea. For Akhenaten, it often seems like simplicity was preferable. Strip away the complicated mythologies, reduce everything to its core principles. In effect, Akhenaten was a fundamentalist in the most literal sense. He wanted to go back to the fundamentals of religious ideas. The change in Aten's name seems to be the capstone of Pharaoh's second phase of religious reformation. The first had kicked off with new temples to Aten and culminated in the king changing his name from Amunhotep to Akhenaten. Now, the second phase saw Pharaoh's religious ideas reaching fuller expression, with great hymns glorifying Aten and a new name encapsulating the purified nature of his identity. From year 9 onwards, references to other gods fell by the wayside, although some of their iconography would persist, like Queen T and her Hathor imagery. But now, official texts and monuments showed the Aten, or Ra, standing alone, his name undimmed by association with any other god. As the king's first decade came to its end and Regnal year 10 began, Akhenaten may have felt that his ideas were finally reaching fruition. His new city was flourishing, and the temples to Aten were nearly complete. His family was growing, and a son was on the way. His courtiers and subjects were loyal in public, and propagated his ideas with skill and gusto. Everywhere the pharaoh looked, things seemed to be going his way. With luck, these ideas would endure for a century or more, and Akhenaten would be recognized as the founder of a new golden age. Fortunately for him, this good feeling would persist for a couple more years. By the time of Regnal Year 12, the king was in a rather celebratory mood indeed. We now move ahead to 1351 BCE, Regnal Year 12 under the majesty of the Nesubiti Neferkeperure Wa Enre, Sadre Akhenaten. The king of Upper and Lower Egypt, beautiful other manifestations of Re, Re's one and only, the son of Re, effective for the Aten. The pharaoh of Egypt, Akhenaten, was approximately 30 years old, give or take. He had been in power for 12 years and married for 10. He was wealthy, influential, and accomplished, having established new religious ideas and even constructed a whole new city. Like great rulers before him, Akhenaten had built something new, something that would stand as a monument to his personality and his image. In the city called Aket Aten, the great pharaoh was sitting pretty. As king of Upper and Lower Egypt, Akhenaten had also inherited an empire. Far to the south, the people of Wawat and Kush, what we call Nubia, lived under Egyptian domination. The Nubians, subjugated by armies and governors, and living in the shadow of fortresses, paid tribute to the Egyptians. Any resistance was crushed swiftly in Pharaoh's name. 
To the north, the land of Kinana or Canaan was inhabited by a dozen or more different peoples. Small kingdoms rose and fell, cities flourished and declined, and populations moved, settled, and relocated across a huge geographical area that is one of the world's great crossroads. Those people, including pastoral nomads, farming communities, and city dwellers, also paid tribute to the Egyptian monarch. They had experienced the swift, brutal actions of pharaoh's soldiers many times over many generations. Now, people living in Canaan were the obedient vassals of Akhenaten. Finally, people on the far frontiers, in Libya, Sinai, Arabia, and Syria, lived at the mercy of pharaoh's goodwill. Whether they were nomadic groups or established kingdoms, these folks were constantly negotiating their relationship with Egypt. Periodic campaigns, raids, might shift the balance of power, but in Akhenaten's time, those people remained Egypt's vassals. In 1351 BCE, Egypt was one of the world's superpowers, and Akhenaten lived the life you might expect of an imperialistic overlord. He subjugated some foreigners, protected others, and kept more in a kind of diplomatic limbo, allowing them to persist as long as they gave the proper deference and sent the proper tribute. With that in mind, it's not surprising that eventually, the king decided to summon his vassals to Egypt, so that they could pay homage in person. So it was, in regnal year 12, the king held a lavish celebration of his imperial power, it was time for a ceremony of tribute. In the hills east of Arket Aten, a pair of tombs show us the days when Akhenaten, pharaoh of Egypt, presided over a ceremony of foreign tribute. The tombs belong to two of the king's high officials, the first of which was named Hoya. We met Hoya last episode, when he took on responsibility for the comfort and livelihood of Queen T. Acting as T's steward, Hoya represented the Queen Mother and her family living in splendor in the palaces of Arket Aten. Well, other parts of Hoya's tomb also show the days when Pharaoh celebrated his imperial power. The Day of Tribute was a huge public event. It took place outside, so that as many people as possible could participate and witness Akhenaten's authority over different lands. In the tomb of Hoya, we see the pharaoh and his wife travelling to the place of ceremony. Akhenaten and Nefertiti sit together in a carrying chair, borne aloft by servants. The king is relaxed, and Nefertiti slips her arm around his waist. Behind them, their two eldest daughters, Merit Aten and Meket Aten, follow on foot. The procession leaves the royal house and makes its way to a parade ground, where a special podium has been established for the occasion. The grand tribute will take place in a courtyard, perhaps the forecourt of the great palace, or the large Aten temple. At the centre of the court, a wooden kiosk stands on a platform. Here, the king and queen will sit enthroned while their servants bring forth the many gifts. Hoya, in his tomb, describes the occasion as follows. Quote, Regnal year 12, second month of the planting season, day 8. Long live the twice royal father, Heka Aten, given life forever continually. Appearance of the king of Upper and Lower Egypt, Neferkeperure Wa Enre, and the king's chief wife, Nefer Neferu Aten Nefertiti, may she live forever continually. They appear on the great carrying chair of Electrum, in order to receive the products of Karu and Kush, the west and the east. All foreign countries gathered as one, and the islands in the midst of the sea are presenting products to the king upon Arket Aten's great throne, of receiving the dues of every foreign country, while the granting of the breath of life is made to them. End quote. Hoya recounts the nature of the occasion, the grand tribute, when people of many foreign lands came to present their gifts to Pharaoh. We are told that all foreign countries gathered as one, including people in the islands in the midst of the sea. This is the Egyptian name for people of the Mediterranean and Aegean. As we'll see in a moment, this might have included people of Crete or even Greece. 
Akhenaten and Nefertiti sit in their thrones beneath the gilded canopy. Above, the sun god, Heka Aten, shines down upon them, and behind, their six daughters array themselves behind their illustrious parents. We see the family appear in another tomb from Amana, a tomb that shows us the tribute itself in all of its majesty. Just next door to Hoya's monument, another tomb also presents scenes of the Year 12 celebration. This tomb belongs to a man named Mary Ray II. Mary Ray, not to be confused with the man we met in episode 118b, was an overseer of royal quarters, something like a major domo for the palace. Presumably, Mary Ray II oversaw the daily affairs of Akhenaten's house, an important position putting him in proximity and communication with Pharaoh himself. For his service, Mary Ray was an esteemed member of the court, and he was present on the day when foreign embassies gave their tribute to Akhenaten. Mary Ray II describes the festival in similar language to Hoya. He says, quote, Regnal year 12, second month of the planting season, day 8. The king of Upper and Lower Egypt, who lives on Ma'at, lord of the two lands, Nefer Keperure Wa Enre, the son of Re, who lives on Ma'at, lord of crowns, Akhenaten, long in his lifetime, and the king's great wife, his beloved, Nefer Neferu Aten Nefertiti, may she live forever continually. Appearance of his majesty on the throne of his divine and royal father, the Aten, who lives on Ma'at, while the chieftains of every foreign land are presenting products to the king and begging peace from him, so that they might be allowed to breathe the breath of life. End quote. Mary Ray introduces the scene in similar terms to Hoya, and notably, both texts include a phrase called granting of the breath of life. This seems to be an Egyptian euphemism for the pharaoh allowing those people to continue living their lives undisturbed. In other words, as long as the tribute comes from Syria, from Canaan, from Nubia, or from any other country, then the pharaoh will grant those people the breath of life. He will allow them to live undisturbed and unattacked. Phrases like this encapsulate the subtle hints of coercion and force which are underlying all of these scenes. Akhenaten's celebration appears as a majestic coming forth of tribute, but beneath the surface, there is always the lingering threat of violence between one power and another. So Mary Ray introduces the scene in fairly similar language to Huya, but what follows in his tomb is unlike anything we've seen yet. In the tomb of Mary Ray II, a wall facing east includes a vast tableau of royal celebration. Akhenaten and Nefertiti sit enthroned within their gilded kiosk, resting atop a podium. Elevated above the crowd, the king and queen sit side by side, with their daughters arrayed behind. Pretty standard so far, but it's what's around the family that truly amazes. The pharaoh and his queen sit in the centre of the wall, but they are dwarfed by a vast scene which stretches out to either side. Arrayed in registers, clad in exotic costumes, and carrying a bewildering variety of goods, hundreds of foreigners, quote-unquote, come before the pharaoh of Egypt. Across a huge expanse of wall, rows and rows of people fill out the mural and make the decorations of Mary Ray's tomb some of the most impressive in the city. I won't describe every group or individual, but if we pick a few interesting figures, we can get a sense of the people who came to this festival. The groups and the gifts give insight into Egypt's empire and how Akhenaten wanted to depict it. To begin with, the tribute bearers who stand directly before the throne seem to be people of the south, carrying ivory tusks, leading leopards on leashes, and bearing platters piled with gold along with myriad other gifts. Men and women of sub-Saharan Africa come to give their tribute to the king. In the top row, tables hold piles of gold or silver shaped into ingots. 
Wooden yokes groan under the weight of ornaments and decorative symbols, including rings of metal and plants, which may themselves be metalwork. Ivory tusks are piled on top of ostrich eggs, and at the back of the surviving section, a pile of shields along with bows and arrows. There is also a significant contingent of captives, southern men tied together led forward by Egyptian soldiers. The pharaoh's troops hold ropes and pull the Nubians forward. It is very much a slave-taking scenario. Remember, while Egyptologists work hard to clarify ancient narratives about slavery and understand the realities of such practices, slavery did still happen. The Egyptian empire in Nubia involved such practices. To the left of Akhenaten's throne, on the other side from the southerners, we see the tribute of the northerners. Interestingly, the two groups of south and north are arranged on the proper sides of the tomb. The southerners appear on the southern half of the wall, and the northerners appear on the northern half. I always like it when Egyptian artists arrange their scenes to reflect the actual geography of the world. It reminds you that these are not just pieces of art, disconnected, to be admired in some museum. They are also part of the world outside the tomb, and the artist's work in the chamber is linked to a society, a landscape, and a world in which he worked. With that context in mind, here is how Pharaoh's artists communicated the idea of northerners and other peoples of the Near East. First up, we see a large group of what might be Syrians. I'm going to use the term Syrians in a very broad sense. Back then, of course, a country or nation of Syria didn't exist. Instead, it was a patchwork of small and medium kingdoms, which the Egyptians described with different names. So historians talk about Syrians, quote-unquote, in the sense of people inhabiting the region which we now call that name. With that in mind, here's how the tombs of Hoya and Mary Ray II depict these people. The Syrians wear their hair down to the shoulders in a style that bunches out at the base. In modern terms, it's kind of a bob style, as if Miss Fisher had let her hair grow down to shoulder length, but kept the shape and let it fill out a bit. Along with that, they also wear beards, long and pointed. The clothing of the Syrians is usually a full-body robe in two different types. One is layered and cut close to the chest with long sleeves. The other is a sort of wrap, with one end swept up over the shoulder. Clad in these garments, the peoples of Syria come forward to offer their praise. Along with the Nubians and Syrians, we also see a variety of other, lesser groups. Desert people, for instance, come forward offering ostrich feathers and eggs, but not much else. It seems that the desert dwellers, or Shasu, were not particularly rich, or at least the Egyptians did not respect them enough to show them that way. Canaanites, meanwhile, bring fancy vases and pots, as well as chests and trees, like the ash or pine tree of Lebanon. Some people bring objects which look like animals, whether these are real livestock or metal images of the animals, like bovine calves, is unclear. Either way, the myriad peoples of Canaan bring their local gifts. Finally, there are the northern prisoners. Like the Nubians, a group of individuals, men and women, shuffle forward. They wear long, multi-layered robes and wear hairstyles and beards in a distinctive fashion. They are tied together, and at the head of a group, an Egyptian man bows low as he presents his captives to the pharaoh. Again, as with the Nubians, the Egyptian holds his prisoners by a rope. It seems that these northerners are destined for a form of slavery or servitude. Who these captives are is not exactly clear. Based on their clothing and adornment, they seem to be folks of North Syrian or even Anatolian origin. That gives a broad range of possibilities. They might be Hittites or Hurrians, or people of a small Syrian kingdom. Whoever they are, they seem to come from a region with good trade connections. Above the prisoners, a set of vases and jugs are gathered together. This pottery bears more than a passing resemblance to styles from Minoan Crete, and they might be imports from the Mediterranean, or local copies of the style. It's hard to tell, but whatever the cause, these northern prisoners seem to come from a land with good contacts, trade and otherwise. 
Sadly, those contacts didn't help much when the soldiers of Pharaoh dragged them before the throne. Rows and rows of prisoners, supplicants on their knees before the majesty of Akhenaten's throne. It's quite clear that this tribute for Pharaoh was not entirely voluntary. Sure, some groups might have come willingly, but many of them seem to be there in bondage. Of course, when it comes to empires, the line between voluntary and coercion is razor thin. Even if you choose to come, your decision may be influenced by the need to carry favour with a powerful and potentially violent neighbour. Like it or not, the ancient Egyptian war machine had already established its willingness to rampage through foreign lands. For the communities living near to Egypt, that threat was always looming in the background. For the Egyptians, particularly those of the ruling class, this was a day of triumph. Ranks of prisoners shuffled onto the parade grounds, and crowds of foreigners knelt before the thrones of Akhenaten and Nefertiti. Overhead, the Aten shone down, casting his light over all kingdoms, and empowering his only son to rule them. Naturally, the men who commissioned these artistic scenes, Hoya and Meri Ray II, made sure to praise Aten and his son in their respective tombs. In one, the tomb owner offers praise to the sun god, ruler of the horizons and all lands, and celebrated the might of Pharaoh, lord of all. The tomb owner said, quote, When you set in life, the land is worshipping you. The east and west are giving you adoration, O Heka Aten, given life forever continually, as you set alive from the sight of men. As for your coming, they raise an outcry to the height of heaven at seeing Aket Aten, which Ray made to be given to his son, the one who lives on Ma'at, while he, that is Aten, causes the king to plunder every foreign country upon which he shines. And Aten bequeaths the whole circuit to the king in order to slake his heart with them, and to do that which pleases his car. For they, the foreigners, are under the feet of Wa In Ra, the one beloved like the Aten, until even the sea gets up on legs, until the mountains stand up to walk, until water flows backwards. O oh, beautiful ruler of the Aten, you are the great sun god, the Aten itself. May Aten cause the king's southern borders to extend as far as the wind, and the northern border to that which Aten illuminates. It is your strength which protects the two lands, and your might which makes the subjects live. O oh, Wa En Ra, beloved like Aten, long in his lifetime. The king's scribe, overseer of the houses of the royal quarters, the steward Meri Ray, true of voice. End quote. Such was the majesty of the occasion, at least for the Egyptian rulers, that they could celebrate their power over other lands and peoples. The prayer I just quoted shows us the scope of Aten and Akhenaten's power, that they can subjugate every country, move mountains, and even turn rivers backwards with the force of their command. Such rhetoric is fairly typical for any empire. How many times in history has some ruler trumpeted their might in the most excessive terms, as if they were God's gift to their country? Well, Akhenaten and his more privileged subjects did the exact same thing. The convocation, or ceremony of tribute, wasn't entirely devoid of pleasures. There is a lighter touch in some scenes where we see things other than rows of prisoners and booty. One mural, a group of foreign musicians comes forward, clutching their instruments. They carry lyres and large wooden harps, and seem ready to add their touch of foreign melody to the proceedings. As we round out chapter one, I'll let these northern musicians carry us through the day when foreign supplicants came to show Pharaoh their obedience. <laughs> Thank you. 
One day, the capital city of Egypt played host to a horde of foreign prisoners and emissaries, rank upon rank of tribute bearers coming from all corners of the world, presented their gifts to the pharaoh. In the midst of this hubbub, Akhenaten sat resplendent, a ruler of all. You may be wondering why Akhenaten decided to throw this kind of party at this particular point in time. The artistic scenes which show the tribute festival, and the hieroglyphic texts that accompany them, are pretty specific on the date, year 12, second month of the planting season, day 8. But why year 12? Why that date? What exactly was Akhenaten celebrating? There are a couple of interpretations of this event, and before we go any further, it's worth noting that the date, year 12, may not have any specific significance. Maybe the king just wanted to celebrate his imperial power, and his followers made it happen. Maybe the date was totally irrelevant. But it's always worth checking if there might be some correlation, some kind of event that could inspire such a display of Egypt's military might. It so happens that we might have evidence for just such an event. South of Egypt, in the lands of Wawat and Kush, Nubia, Two stelae have come to light which describe a war or raid into the country during the reign of Akhenaten. Now, the exact date of these stelae is unclear. The stone is damaged at just the wrong point. We know that we have a 2, and it's possible that there was originally a 10 in front of it. Which means that these stelae, and the war they describe, either happened in Akhenaten's second regnal year, or his 12th. Because of the damage, no one is willing to put money down on either date. But, if the war took place in year 12, then maybe Akhenaten's grand festival, his celebration of imperial power, coincided with a very real victory in the southern lands. We find the first stealer at the fortress of Amada, and it tells us how, in an unknown year, raiders from the highlands of Nubia came into the Nile Valley. They were hungry, stealing food, and fleeing into the desert to escape the might of Pharaoh's troops. In a short, broken text, the Amada Stealer tells us these events. Quote, Regnal year, unknown. First month of inundation, day 16 of the living ruler, and of him whose sword is victorious, beloved of Aten, in the land of Egypt. The king of Upper and Lower Egypt, who lives on Ma'at, lord of the two lands, Nefer Kepururre, the son of Re, who lives on Ma'at, lord of crowns, Akhenaten, long in his lifetime, who has appeared upon the seat of his father, the Aten, like Ra in the sky, and upon earth every day. Now, his majesty, life, prosperity, health, was in Aket Aten, when one came to tell his person that enemies of the foreign country, Ikaita, were plotting rebellion, and they had even invaded the lands of the Nile, while taking all sustenance away from them as they roamed the desert, in order to fill their bellies." End quote. This stela is very fragmentary, and the translation I just gave you fills in quite a few gaps. This damage is doubly unfortunate. Not only do we lose the full context, but we also lose some specific references. The regnal year is lost, so we can't be sure. And when the text says, His Majesty was in Arket Aten, we don't actually know that it said Arket Aten. This part is lost and has been filled in by translations. It's equally possible that it referenced a city like Thebes or Memphis. So, unfortunately, we have no idea exactly when this stela should be dated. Was it in the first phase of Akhenaten's reign, when he was still living in the southern city? Or does it belong to the second phase, when he had moved to the horizon of Aten? Unfortunately, we just don't know, so we have to turn to our second stealer in order to get some corroborating information. We find the second stealer at the fortress of Buhen, the mightiest bastion of Egyptian rule, a true landmark of their empire in Nubia. On this lengthier text, another scribe records Akhenaten's war in Nubia. Quote, Regnal year 2 or 12, third month of the inundation, day 20 of Aten the ruler, and of the king of Upper and Lower Egypt, who lives on Ma'at, lord of the two lands, Wa-Enra, blah, 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 you know the gist. 
Now, His Majesty, life, prosperity, health, was in Arket Aten when one came to tell his person that the enemies of the foreign country Ikaita were plotting rebellion and had even invaded the land of the Nubians, while taking away all sustenance from them as they roamed the desert in order to escape from him. Thereupon, His Majesty charged the king's son of Cush, that is, the viceroy, and overseer of the southern countries, with assembling an army, in order to defeat the enemies of this foreign country of Ikaita. These enemies were found on the eastern side of the river, to the north of the ponds of the mining region, upon the highland, and the fugitive was smitten. While the cry of victory was in the hearts of the Egyptians, they said, A fierce lion slaying myriads throughout the land, in valour and in victory. List of the plunder which His Majesty carried off from the country of Ikaita. Living Nubians, 82 and more. Young warriors, unknown. Nubian women, unknown. Their children, 12. Total of living heads, 145. Those who were impaled, unknown. Those who were slain, unknown. Those whose hands were removed, unknown. Total, 225. Total sum, 361, which is an error. The king's son of Cush, the overseer of the southern countries, Tutmose, said, Fear of you is in their hearts, your majesty. There are no rebels in your time, for they have achieved non-existence. The chiefs of Ikaita have fallen to your might. Your battle cries are like a fiery flame following after every foreign country, and every foreign country is united with one wish, namely, that they might despoil their lands daily, so that the breath of life may be sent to their noses by your car. O Lord of the two lands, sole one of Re, may your car act in order to reach all your enemies. End quote. Once again, the stealer from Buhen is badly damaged, and there are many gaps in the text. The quote I just read to you is partially restored, and so parts of it are unreliable. So when it says that the pharaoh was in Aket Aten, we've had to fill that in, and we can't be sure. Either way, it seems that in Regnal Year 12, or 2, nomads from the highlands of Nubia entered the Nile Valley. They came in search of food, and perhaps plunder. But for the Egyptian overseers, these incursions were unacceptable. The pharaoh's troops chased the nomads back into the deserts, and they attacked them. The Egyptian warriors, fierce in battle and raising mighty war cries, brought their enemies low and took them into bondage. A total of 145 living captives or prisoners were taken, and 225 people were slain or murdered. Again, we can't be sure of many details, but this is the best evidence we have so far. It's certainly clear that the Buhen and Amada stealers record the same event, a campaign down into Nubia by Akhenaten's troops. Although we can't be sure of the date, Regnal Year 12 is a reasonably good bet. It seems that Akhenaten's representatives, his soldiers and governors, ravaged parts of Nubia at this time, crushing a quote-unquote rebellion. They took prisoners, men, women, and children, and brought them back to the fortresses. Perhaps, from there, the Egyptian troops took their captives to Arket Aten, where they appeared, tied together, in the grand convocation of Akhenaten's imperial celebration. If that's the case, then maybe the tribute celebration was in fact a celebration of this war. Well, maybe. The dates of these two stelae, assuming they record events in year 12, both take place in the season of inundation or flood. This is roughly September to November. Meanwhile, the festival of tribute took place in the season of planting, just a couple of months later. Now those are pretty good synchronicities. The Egyptian troops had plenty of time to go to war, destroy their ragtag enemy, and then report back to Egypt in time for the celebration. So things work out chronologically, and some scholars, notably John Darnell and Colleen Manasseh, have connected this Nubian campaign with the Grand Festival of Tribute, which is certainly plausible. However, there is a caveat. The war in Nubia works out relatively well from a chronological perspective, but what about the other lands that showed up at the festival? 
Fetching prisoners and tribute from Libya, Sinai, the Near East, etc. would have required a lot of planning, a lot of time. It doesn't seem like something you just throw together in a week. So we have to be cautious before assuming that the tribute festival was a commemoration of a victory down in Nubia. An alternative explanation might be that the festival of tribute actually inspired this war. Perhaps what actually happened is that Akhenaten soldiers down in Nubia went out on a campaign because the grand festival was coming up. For the governor of Nubia, the viceroy Tutmos, this kind of event was probably a good opportunity to show his loyalty and service to Pharaoh. I mean, what could be a better gift than prisoners, freshly captured in battle, and all the plunder of the southern countries? If Akhenaten was publicly hosting a celebration, why not give him tangible proof of Egypt and his military might? So maybe the grand festival of tribute was a celebration of victory in Nubia, or maybe that victory was done in anticipation of the upcoming festival. Either way, we can be sure that at some point, Akhenaten's troops ravaged the highlands of Nubia, taking captives that they could present to Pharaoh. When that happened, another chapter in the Egyptian empire reached its conclusion. These were happy days for those in power. In Regnal Year 12, Akhenaten hosted a grand celebration indeed. We still don't know the exact motivations, but it's possible that this was related to military campaigns. With his troops fresh from victory, the king could afford to be generous to those who came to him. He permitted his vassals in the Near East to live. He gave them, quote, the breath of life. Above him, the sun god Aten shone over all lands, the pharaoh's dominion. At this occasion of victory, the Egyptian empire was enjoying a shining moment indeed. To celebrate this day and the majesty of his king, another of Akhenaten's servants paid public homage to the glory of the ruler. A man named Tutu, who served in the palace of Akhenaten and was greatly appreciated by the king, offered this praise of his pharaoh. In a lengthy speech, Tutu glorified the king. Then, in his tomb, he added a variety of other groups, including officials, scribes, soldiers, and foreigners, with captions showcasing their praise of the pharaoh. As we round out this episode, I give you Tutu's praise of Akhenaten, the words of the courtier himself, and then those of Pharaoh's subjects. Quote, That which the Chamberlain Tutu said, O ruler who makes monuments for his father, and repeats it, may you foster generations from generations. O Wa En Ra, you are Ra. It is the living Aten who begat you, and you will achieve his lengthy lifetime, while he rises in heaven to give birth to you. O oh my lord, wise like the father, perceptive, precise, searcher of hearts. Your hands are like the hands of Aten, so that you can build people according to their various characters. O oh my lord, may the Aten give you the many jubilees which he has decreed. You are his child, it is from him that you issued. O oh, Wa En Ra, image of Ra continually, who raises up Ra and satisfies Aten, who causes the land to understand the one who makes it. May you illuminate his name for the subjects, and administer for him the dues which are owed to his rays. May Aten acclaim you in heaven joyfully on the day in which you appear. The entire land quivers before you, Karu, Kush, all lands, their arms are extended to you in adoration, to your Ka, as they beg for life in wretchedness. They say, give us breath. Terror of you stops up their noses, and their prosperity comes to an end. Your divine power is in them as a repellent, after your war cry has annihilated their limbs like the fire which devours them. The rays of the Aten will rise over you continually, and the one who makes your monuments strong like heaven is manifest in them forever. So long as the Aten exists, you shall be alive and rejuvenated continually. End quote. That was all Tutu glorifying his king in the most verbose terms. Now, 
Tutu adds a number of captions to other groups, including soldiers, officers, scribes, high officials, and even foreigners. These texts are also quite interesting. Quote, Speech of the Chatti, Vizier, and other high officials. How good they are, your plans, O Nefer Keperura Wa Enra! How prosperous is he who is in your entourage! O beautiful child of the Aten, you shall raise up generations, and you shall endure like the Aten. Speech of the Officers The officials and the chief men of the army who are standing in the presence of Pharaoh, life, prosperity, health, they say, The ruler is bright on the Aten's behalf, and abounding in property, and consequently the Pharaoh makes men. Speech of Tutu's Charioteer Oh, you are beautiful like the Aten, the one who begat him, Nefer Keperura Wa Enra, the one who builds people and raises the younger generations, while he is lasting like heaven when Aten is in it. Speech of the Foreigners The servants belonging to every foreign country, they say, O oh, living Ra, Nefer Keperura Wa Enra, we are under your commands continually forever. End quote. Tutu's grandiose declarations reflect an overwhelming focus on the imperial power of the pharaoh and his relationship with the sun god. Aten rules in heaven, Akhenaten rules on earth, and together the two are destined to live forever and reign with millions of jubilee festivals. Tutu is not alone in presenting such sentiments. All of the tombs of Amana paint glorifying pictures of the pharaoh. And it certainly seems as though the high officials who served Akhenaten were well aware that his favour was the essential ingredient to their continued success. The same relationship perhaps plays out between Egypt and its vassals. For every emissary who came to Amana, willing or unwilling, it must have been abundantly clear that the good will of the king of Egypt was necessary for their continued prosperity and perhaps even survival. So it was that the celebration of Akhenaten's imperial power occurred in Akhet Aten in the planting season of Regnal Year 12. Perhaps to the ordinary people witnessing the vast ranks of soldiers, the endless trains of prisoners, and the piles of plunder and booty that accumulated around the pharaoh, perhaps it seemed like the glory days of Egypt's empire could never end. With the sun god shining on their king, and their troops ever victorious in battle, the limits of Egyptian power were surely impervious to any challenge. How wrong they were. We now come to the end of this episode, and also the end of phase two in the reign of Akhenaten, king of Egypt. On the next episode, we will do our second summary of Akhenaten's reign, recapping everything we've learned so far, and putting it together in context. Following that, we resume the narrative once more, starting with Akhenaten's empire in Canaan and Syria, and how it very nearly all came crashing down. Thank you for joining me on the History of Egypt podcast. Before I go, I'd like to extend special gratitude to all of my supporters on Patreon, and especially Linda, Neil, and Terry, my priest-level backers. Your ongoing generosity is greatly appreciated, folks. Thank you for helping me continue with this immense project and passion. That's all from me. I'll see you soon. May the Aten shine brightly upon you, and may your days be happy. (laughs) ¶¶